Hi, uh, I'm Lynn Joyrich from the Department of Modern Culture and Media, and I'm here to talk about media. Um, so one of the things I wanted to start with is just to, of course, recognize that media, as it is currently organized and operated, and most importantly owned, um, is definitely part of what this movement is criticizing, and that's now by massive corporations that, through their history of mergers and acquisitions, have concentrated their control, their power over what we see and hear and read. Um, and in fact, today in the US, ownership of the news media has been concentrated in the hands of really just six incredibly powerful media conglomerates uh, who own almost everything. Um, so Time Warner, Walt Disney, Viacom, CBS Corporation, NBC Universal, and Rupert, Rupert Mur Murdoch's News Corps uh, are both horizontally spread over numerous media forms so that they own TV networks, cable networks, stations, movie studios, newspapers, magazines, book publishing houses, music labels, websites, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and they're also vertically integrated so that they control everything from the initial production to the final distribution. So uh, I was going to read you all the things that are owned between these six, but I don't have time to do that if anybody's curious what they own. Again, almost every media form you could think of is owned by one of those six. Uh, I could tell you later. So obviously that control and concentration and ownership is really troubling for any consideration of media access and equality. Um, and that concentration and control, I think, also helps to explain um, at least in a significant part, uh, why the mainstream news, so things like national broadcast news and cable news, you know, why they were very slow to pick up and start reporting on the Occupy movement, um, as compared, for example, to the Tea Party movement, right? For all the claims of grassroots efforts on the Tea Party, right, that actually had financial ties to those very, uh, very media institutions and corporations so of course it was easy, both in that they had people located right there, um, and certainly in their economic interests for those media corporations to cover the Tea Party, while neither of those things is true to the same degree with the Occupy movement. So really, I think you know this is probably needless to say, but I'll say it anyways, that sort of extreme concentrated ownership um, affects editorial and reporter independence and therefore undermines any real notion of freedom of the press. So that's crucial, that kind of economic analysis. But I would want to you know, go on and say that the media are not just industries demand, that therefore demand from us an institutional analysis, which they do. They're also, of course, meaning-making systems. They're systems of communication and representation. So it's equally important to analyze how they work on that level. In other words, to think about how the media present and frame their information through particular conventions that then determine the meanings that we make from them, right? So in other words, certain ways of telling a story, even of defining what a news story is, have become so accepted that we all, even those in the media, tend to take those for granted, even though, even though those conventions um, produce certain ways of seeing or maybe keep us from seeing certain things, produce certain kinds of understandings or maybe you know, block our understanding, et cetera. So just to name some of those, for example, we should think about the way that all news, that kind of cliche that all news is bad news. In other words, the construction of news is defined as disruption. So therefore, it sort of predefines those who make the news, right, as the disruptors, as the problem, and it blocks seeing how the status quo itself could be the problem. Um, another uh, convention of the news is the way it tends to organize itself into a simple us versus them uh, sort of construction so that the very convention of like the news anchor person looking right into the camera and speaking to the us about the them reported on already separates the viewer supposedly from what's going on. Um, also producing separations is the way that news programming tends to be structured into very easily definable categories and claims. So it tends to reify meanings into these very singular unified messages that are then put into their own separate categories, like the way international news gets separated from national news, gets separated from health news, et cetera, so that we're led not to see the connections. Um, within those categories, there's then the production of particular kinds of spokesmen 
right, which reinforces only particular definitions of expertise. So some people, right, have the status to look in the camera and speak right to us, and then they are granted that sort of elevation, whereas other people become, in a way, just the kind of background bodies who provide the visible evidence, but are not sort of figured as able to speak for themselves. Um, uh, that's tied, of course, to the way that the news as, as a commercial enterprise has to, it depends on attention-grabbing imagery, right, the role of visible evidence to get attention. Um, and th that's tied to the way that, in general, news in our culture is really tied to an advertising model. It's made to both fit in and help naturalize that advertising model, where everything is sort of figured as an image on display for us to see whether we want to buy or not, or a brand we want to affiliate with or not, which is obviously not the way in which we should be evalu evaluating our political participation. So those kinds of conventions have all become really routinized in news gathering work, in other words, again, even the people who make the news kind of just take those for granted as just the way to tell a story, right? So it's not necessarily that the news is biased out of a conscious intention to deceive us, but because these very modes of seeing are inscribed in the conventions and in the usual operations. So what I think is important for people in being active is to think about, well, what are those modes of seeing? What are those conventions? How can we negotiate with them? How can we either work within or against them to produce something differently? So for example, just some you know, kind of suggestions I would throw out there is I think it's important to try to maintain both the continuity and the dispersion of the protests to try to push up against that definition of news as just an isolatable disruption, that it happens at an isolatable time and place that is the disruption. Instead, we want to emphasize the sort of ongoing work. Um, we also need to think about how to change the typical we of the news. Um, and in fact, I think that that's what that, you know, we are the 99% railing cry is so brilliantly doing is like, really sort of appropriating the we and producing a sense of inclusivity across differences that's different from the way that the national news tends to articulate itself as the definer of what the we are. Um, on that note, I think it's also important to sort of emphasize how the so-called lack of a singular message, right? A lot of pundits have said, oh, the problem with this movement is there's a lack of a singular message. We need to emphasize that is the message. Right? In other words, that there's a connection, right? that it's trying to articulate the connections and continuities between things. And so it's reformulated what we even think of that message. That can be embodied by simple things like just when people are interviewed to have them speak in groups or not one-on-one -on -one to, again, emphasize that sense of unity across diversity and vice versa. Um, so in some, what I'm trying to get at is that we really need to try to think of ways to engage with mainstream media conventions, even as we work to reform them. There also, of course, are non-mainstream media uh, that have been really active in here. And I don't want to be sort of too utopian about things like, you know, social media, because those two, of course, are commercial media. They are becoming more and more so. They also are advertising supported. They also are used to kind of track your every move to be able to further target you as a consumer. So I don't want to sound too utopian about them, but nonetheless, they do have potential for opening up a dispersal of voices for, you know, having more equal access, for allowing more people to get involved. So the last thing I guess I want to say is that, again, it's a common slogan in terms of politics to say, you know, the whole world is watching. And, you know, indeed the whole world is watching, but I would say we need to work to make media something that invites us not just to watch. It shouldn't only address us as people who are onlookers on the them doing something, right? And we need to work within media and against traditional media forms to be able to produce a media that makes us active participants, right? Not just the watchers at home, which you're all doing. So, thank you.